Hello, hello, my true crime junkies. Welcome back. I am back with another episode today um, over the weekend with a bonus episode that I will be posting um, either Saturday or Sunday. So make sure to subscribe on any of your favorite platforms so you don't miss any of these episodes coming up. Um, so this episode, it is called Greenlee's Kidnapping. It was a terrible crime with a tragic outcome. In 1953, the kidnapping of a six-year-old boy in a get-rich-quick scheme led to a massive investigation that captured the pair of culprits, but not before they did the unthinkable. Um, This is when he was taken at approximately 10.55 a.m. on September 28, 1953. Sister Morand of the French Institute of Notre Dame de Sion a school for small children in Kansas City, Missouri, answered the door and was confronted by a woman who said she was the aunt of Bobby Greenlees. Robert Cosgrove Greenlees Jr., known as Bobby, was six-year-old and the son of Robert Cosgrove Greenlees Sr., a wealthy automobile dealer who reside in Mission Hills, Kansas City, Missouri. The woman informed Sister Moran that Bobby's mother had just suffered a heart attack and had been taken to St. Mary's Hospital. The woman appeared visibly upset and apologized to Sister Moran for her condition. Upon getting Bobby, Sister Moran told him that an aunt had called at the school for him, but she did not tell Bobby that his mother had suffered a heart attack. Now, Sister Moran recalled that Bobby walked directly to the woman without hesitation, and there was nothing in his action or behavior to indicate doubt on his part that this woman was his aunt. As the woman left the school, she had an arm around Bobby's shoulder and was holding his hand. Sister Moran last saw them as they entered a taxi cab. At approximately 11.30 a.m. that day, Sister Marthana of the school called the Greenlees home to inquire about Mrs. Greenlees' condition, spoke to Mrs. Greenlees, and at that time learned that the story told by the woman who called for Bobby was false. Mrs. Greenlees immediately called her husband, who rushed home, and after hearing the story of what happened, notified the the chief of police in Kansas City, who in turn reported the matter to the FBI. Willard Pearson Creech, cab driver for the Toadman Cab Company in Kansas City, told authorities that shortly before 11 a.m. on September 28, 1953, a woman whom, whose description fit that of the woman who had called the school entered the cab and requested him to drive her to the school of Notre Dame de Sion. Upon arriving at the school, she told the Creech, she told Creech to wait for her because she desired to be driven to the cat's drug store at Westport and Main Street in Kansas City. Approximately six minutes, the woman re-entered the cab accompanied by a small boy fitting the description of Bobby Greenlees. When Creech last saw them, they had stopped behind a blue 1952 or 1953 Ford sedan bearing Kansas license plates. A few hours after the kidnapping, the Greenleases received the first ransom letter concerning the return of their son. The first letter, mail specially delivered and postmarked 6 p.m. September 28, 1953, demanded 600000 in 20s and $10 bills be placed in a duffel bag. The kidnappers promised Bobby's safe return in 24 hours and as long as there were no tricks in delivering the money. The second ransom letter was postmarked 9.30 p.m. on September 29, 1953. Inside the envelope in which this letter was mailed was the Jerusalem medal which had been worn by Bobby Greenlees. The letter again contained a demand for $600,000 and stated that Bobby's Bobby was okay, but homesick. Overall, the Greenleases received over a half dozen ransom notes and 15 telephone calls. The final communications between the Greenleases and the kidnappers was a phone call received at 1 a.m. on October 5th, 1953 at the Greenleases' residence. 
The kidnappers stated that they had received the 600,000 ransom money and assured the Greenleases that their son was alive and that he will be returned in 24 hours. Unknown to the family, the kidnappers Carl Hull and Bonnie Hetty had killed the boy soon after the abduction and buried the body near Hetty's house in St. Joseph, Missouri. Then the two murder took the murderers took the ransom money and traveled approximately 380 miles to St. Louis, Missouri. On October 5, 1953, Hope purchased two metal suitcases and transferred the ransom money from the duffel bag to the suitcases, leaving the duffel bag in an ash pit in South St. Louis. Carl Hall took Boney Hetty, who was drunk, to an apartment he rented in Arsenal Street, also in St. Louis. Hetty immediately went to sleep and Hall deserted her there in the apartment, leaving only $2,000 of the 600000 ransom money in her purse. On October 6, 1953, Hope purchased two large garbage cans and a shovel, placed them in a rented car, and drove to Merrimack River in St. Louis County, where he intended to bury the ransom money. However, he could not find a suitable place. He left the cans in a deserted clubhouse and drove back to the Coral Courts Motel, where he was staying. Hall became suspicious of a person in the vicinity of the motel during the afternoon of October 6, 1953, and moved to an apartment at the Townhouses Hotel in St. Louis. Now authorities get a break in the case. A telephone call was received at the 11th District in St. Louis Police Department about 3.30 p.m., on October 6, 1953, from John Oliver Hager, a driver from the Ace Cab Company in St. Louis. His information led to the arrest of Carl Austin Hall, who identified himself as John James Byrne by officers of the St. Louis Police Department at the Townhouse Hotel in St. Louis during the evening of October 6, 1953. Later that night, he led the officers to an apartment on Arsenal Street in St. Louis where Hall's girlfriend, Bonnie Emily Hetty, was taken into custody. Hall was interrogated by the FBI agents and others, other law enforcement agencies several times after his arrest and insisted that practically all of the 600000 ransom money was in his possession at the time he was arrested by the St. Louis Police Department. Hall admitted to FBI agents the planning of the kidnapping, the actual the abduction of the victim, and to burying the body in the yard of Mrs. Hetty residence. He also admitted picking up the ransom money, but denied that he killed the victim. At this time, he implicated Tom Marsh, stating he had turned the victim over to Marsh, Hall later admitted Marsh was a fictitious individual, a fictitious individual, and the only person involved in the kidnapping were Bonnie Hetty and himself. It was not until October 11 of 1953 that Hall admitted he and Bonnie Hetty transported the victim from Kansas City, Missouri to a point just outside of Kansas City in Overland Park. Kansas were is where Hall shot the victim to death. He then transported the body approximately 45 miles back to St. Joseph, Missouri, where he buried where he buried it in Bonnie's Hetty's yard and planted flowers on the grave. Bonnie Hetty admitted assisting Hall in the preparation of the ransom letters and notes of the instructions to the Greenleaf families concerning the payoff the ransom as well as going to school and obtaining custody of the victim using the ruse that his mother was ill. The boy's body was found by FBI agents at 8.40 a.m. October 7th of 1953, buried near their porch of the Hetty resident at 1201 South 38th Street in St. Joseph, Missouri. His body had been wrapped in a plastic bag and a large quantity of lime had been poured over this bag. The Greenlees family dentist identified the body as that of Bobby Greenlees at 1.05 p.m. October 7 of 1953. 
Blood stains were found on the basement floor and steps in the Hetty residence and on the nylon blouse and fiber rug. Some of the 38 caliber shell casings were also found in the house. These shells casings were examined by the FBI lab and it was found that they had been fired from a 38 caliber snub, no smith, and a Western revolver in Hall's possession at the time of his arrest. The FBI lab also confirmed that a lead bullet recovered from the rubber floor mat in the Plymouth station wagon owned by Bonnie Hetty was also fired from the Hall's 38 caliber revolver. Now, October 30th of 1953, Carl Hall and Bonnie Headed appeared before Judge Albert L. Reeves in federal court in Kansas City, Missouri, at which time they entered a plea of guilty to the indictment. On November 19th of 1953, after the hearing, after hearing the evidence, a jury in the federal court in Kansas City, Missouri, recommended the death penalty after only an hour and eight minutes of deliberations. Fifteen minutes after the verdict was announced, Judge Reeve sentenced both of them to, ex to be executed on December 18, 1953. Judge Reeve said, I think the verdict fits the evidence. It is most cold-blooded, brutal murder I have ever tried. Carl Austin Hall and Bonnie Emily Hetty were executed together in Missouri's lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary in Jefferson City, Missouri on December 18, 1953. Hall was pronounced dead at 12, 12 a.m. and Bonnie Hetty was pronounced dead 20 seconds later. Over half of the 600,000 was never found. FBI investigations established that the two suitcases which reportedly contained the ransom money and which were in Hall's possession at the time of his arrest were not brought to the 11th District Precinct Station, as testified by the arrest officer, arresting officer, Lieutenant Louis Ira Shoulders and Patrolman Elmer Dolan. Both officers were... Subsequently, federally indicted for perjury, Lieutenant Shoulders was convicted on April 15, 1954 and sentenced to three years in prison, and the patrolman Dolan was convicted on March 31st of 1954 and is sentenced to two years. After they were released from prison, both returned to St. Louis area. Shoulders died on May 12, 1962. Dolan received a full pardon from President Johnson on July 21st of 1965. So this is an amazing case, a sad case, um, but at least justice was served and they were able to, um, they properly punished those people. So I do hope you guys enjoy this, this case, the story of the Greenleaf's kidnapping. And um, I will be bringing more story, more stories, more cases like these in the upcoming episodes. So again... Don't forget to subscribe and also share just to help support my podcast. I am on Instagram and on YouTube and any of the podcast platforms. You can search by looking up True Crime Junkies. That's J-U-N-K-I-E-Z. And if you want to message me directly, you can. I will make sure I get back to you. Alrighty, so hope you guys have a great week. Bye.